This is a special fly in the Miramichi called the Veteran Special. This one we've doctored up with a little extra bit of meat. Help us catch something. Should be good this afternoon. Okay, can you uncatch me now? Well, no, you stay there for a while. Okay, but really. <laughs> no, really. No, really. No, really. coast and coming this far east we're almost as far east as we can get we have heard the the Miramichi is just renowned for fly fishing for Atlantic salmon so we were really really looking forward to it I had it really high expectations my good friend Peter Morrison and I are in for a special treat a few days of fishing on the world-renowned Miramichi River here in eastern New Brunswick it's late July, but with a long stretch of cool and wet weather, the conditions are just starting to turn, and guide Ken Vickers from Country Haven Lodge has been surveying the river intently to try and get us into some prized Atlantic salmon. Still, with the city of Miramichi as our kind host, we're sure to have a fine day on the water and around the town. The maritime hospitality has been second to none, the fishing challenging but rewarding. Let's hope it's another spectacular day on the river. Okay, you guys ready? Well, ready as I'll ever be. And our first vantage point was about, I don't know, about 100 feet above the water. And my jaw dropped open. Gorgeous, gorgeous piece of water. River runs through it. Nice smooth run, nice riffle along the edge. You could see where the obvious travel area was for the fish to go. And as soon as we got there, we saw fish on the surface right away and that really gets your juices flowing and you're just pumped you just know something's going to happen so are the fish more or less likely to be taking dries on a sunny day well you know i i've i've seen it here 12 o'clock in the day sunny days and that hot still come up and take that dry fly huh. it's hard to predict what they're going to do but i know here last night the air got real heavy right and some of them come up and jump, but you could just, I've seen it happen before when that air gets real heavy. Yeah. They, they won't do nothing, they lay right on the bottom. Low barometer. I love fishing with the local guides here. These guys are, they're low key. They're down to earth people. They know their stuff. They're fishing their waters. They know what's happening. When they talk, you gotta listen. Where are you going? I'm gonna go right here, I think. Wow, another beautiful day in the Miramichi. We're uh, fishing the same pool that we did yesterday, uh, but everything is completely different. The weather is, uh, has changed a lot. We got a bit of a breeze, which will be nice because that'll keep some of the bugs at bay. And uh, different light, you can see into the water better. But one of the things is I guess the fish will be able to see us better. So a little stealthier today maybe, but uh, this is just gorgeous. We're ready to go. Hopefully some big fish today. Nice, good size ones. I'd start off with a short line, Courtney. Okay. And just keep, just keep lengthening it out, you know, according to cast, a couple of casts, lengthen it a little more until you get the line that you need. Okay. Then I'd start moving down. Okay. But then and I'm I going out, drifting over? 40 uh, or 45? Yeah, just a little bit more than a 45. Just a okay. little bit, yeah. Okay. <laughs> that time I screwed up. But that was a fish catching cast. I'm waiting for it. I'm waiting for it. It's about to hit. It's about come on, come on. No. Ah. No. Well, this wind is keeping the bugs away. That's a nice thing. Yeah, it's putting all down for all my casting. But we'll see. It's still a beautiful day. Waiting for the big grab today. Come on, come on, come on, come on. That's, That's right. the spot. Oh. Okay, what was the tip of casting in the wind? Tight loops. 
Tight low, loops. Low trajectory, tight loops. High on the back, low on the front? Correct. So with the wind, you got to have real tight loops. So you've always got the wind blowing downstream. You don't want the fly line running into you. So I was using a snake roll and just doing a snake and then roll cast presentation. And we don't have to really cast far, but you want to get that line laying affirmatively on the water so it doesn't blow all over the place. And of course, spook the fish. Wait for the big grab from the big fish. Okay. Did you get it? I had that one swirl on it. That I was kind of cool. That was just when I was pulling in to recast. Dry fly fishing is a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we got to consume so many calories in the evening. Yeah, I haven't had any problem doing that. <laughs> oh, this feels good. Feeling the love right now. Big grab, big grab. Let's go. about an hour and a half now. It's a little bit quiet this morning, dealing with some wind as far as the casting is concerned, which, you know, sometimes can be an issue. It's not that big a deal, but it's certainly uh, quieter. I don't know if the brightness has something to do with it. Um, I've changed it up. I've gone from a dry fly to a wet fly now, seeing if that'll make any difference. I do have a little aquarium going around my uh, legs here, though. I got some chubs and some little minnows or salmon fry, I'm not sure what they are. So that's keeping me entertained for a little while anyway. I mean, there's a lot of fish underneath the wires here, but you see the wake off of that rock, yep. the, the wake toward us, not the inside wake, but right. this wake, yeah, yeah, yeah. where that foam was going down there? Yep. Just at the edge of that foam, they were traveling right up through there last, last okay. night. So, so I suspected they'd be doing. Just try and cast up there. I can get across there, that's yeah. no problem. Yep. Like if the you'd... flat water on this side, where it gets dark, just keep drifting them through. Oh, a lot of them will stay, like still stay right there, but some of them will move over. Yeah. And they'll be right up along that, just like I said, right along this side of that foam line a little bit. Excellent. Okay. Well, guys were, I was wondering why guys were using nine weights and now, and you see what the wind now is going to do. Now you see why? Yep. Just makes it a lot easier. Why do they use nine weights? It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> but now, would it make a big difference? It's just a little easier in the in yeah. the wind. You don't have to work so hard. Well, maybe I should get myself a nine weight. Especially if you're casting bummers. Bummers. <laughs> <laughs> One thing about the Miramichi is just the people and the way they talk. I just love it. And there's a great fly that we also use in British Columbia called a bomber. Bars, which is, <laughs> we fish with bombers, and they're called bombers. That's how fast they say it. I think he's bomb. Bombers. It was pretty fun. Every time he said it, we just burst out laughing. I'm going to change it up. The sun's brighter, and I want to go to a little more subtle pattern, so I'm going to a green butt uh, skunk, or like a b green butt black bear. Nothing. Got my eye on fish right out here. No, you don't. So just doing cast by cast, just sweeping the water. Downstream swing, 45 degrees, let it swing. And then every couple casts, I'll add another two or three feet of line out and then I'm just covering a whole new section of water exposing the fly hopefully to more fish and waiting for the big grab. The wind is really starting to pick up, but the fishing isn't. 
so there's only one thing to do. Time to catch the boat and go to the local hatchery. Peter and I are here with Mark Hambrook at the Miramichi Salmon Conservation Center. It's absolutely gorgeous. Beautiful. Yeah, it was built in 1873 by the federal government, and there were a few hatcheries built before it, but this is the oldest existing hatchery in Canada. So going back to 1873, you wouldn't think at that time you would actually need a hatchery, really? It was a big commercial fishery then, and of course fish they always have booms and busts. So developing a hatchery where you could stock the river in the, the lean times, they figured it would have continuous supply of salmon for the commercial fishery. We see this as our insurance policy for our river. And currently, our population is pretty good, and we have difficulty in finding vacant habitats to stock young salmon in, and that's wonderful. So most of our actually production area right now is in brook trout, and we have a contract to supply the provincial government with uh, brook trout for all their lake stocking. So we do more than that. I mean, this is an education center. It's a center for research. We attract students from around the country here. And we have a big education program with the youth of the area. Our salmon stay here two, three, sometimes four years in the river that before long. they go to the ocean. So we, we can't overstock the river because there's only so much space and so much food to accommodate a certain number of fish. And what we're finding today is that we're only getting, and it varies, but it, roughly 4% of the smolts will come back as grills. Whereas when I started my career with fisheries and oceans many years ago, we were getting a 15% return rate. So the problem seems to be marine survival. Ocean survival is the biggest problem. Exactly. And that's the big million dollar question, several million dollar question. <laughs> you have been working with First Nations. Do, um, what is it that you're doing to incorporate them in the process? We have a project here now with uh, Eel Ground First Nation to develop a, a traditional Micmac fishing village. Oh, wow. And so we can show what happens today and you now the, the history behind it. And since we're already a bit of a tourist destination, being on our property, you know, we should bring in more visitors. Absolutely. And I think it's important for people to learn the First Nations history too because... There's a misconception in the white community as well that some of these First Nations food fisheries are catching too many fish. Oh yeah, for sure. And what we're seeing is that the fish that are coming back are fully seeding the river. Yeah. And there's been a First Nations fishery here all along. And so I think that we have to look in other places uh, to lay blame uh, <laughs> as opposed to the First Nation Ours community. Ours is the same. I Interesting, a uh, country yeah. that's you know, over 3,000 miles wide. We're on the opposite coastline. Sounds like a broken record, exact yeah. same situation yeah, back and forth. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Mark, thank you very much for having us. It was wonderful to see the well, facility, and it's great to do the comparison, too. Well, I'm good. I'm glad you came all the way from the West Coast to experience our fishery here. Yes. Thanks for your hospitality. You're welcome. Okay, so we fed some nice Atlantic salmon. It's time to get back on the water and catch one. water. No doubt, eh? Yeah, it is. The location we went to this afternoon, it was beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. The pool was a lot larger than any of the other areas. You're going to get a big one tonight. Yep. We waded across the river. It's quite a heavy weight, actually. I was quite surprised because it, was, it wasn't very deep, but it, the water was quite heavier. Heavier than I thought it was going to be. Oh, that was a good workout. Nice. You'd be in good nice shape if you had to do that every day. Huh? And then I just do a triple surge and cheer. Are you going to have my leader that long? Uh huh. Same as it was before. Looks longer. No. You, my dear, are ready. Ready to rock and roll. Look at that. Look at that. I'm going to take you out here at the head of it. How deep are we? Not very deep. You're only going to be up to your knees and then it's going to get Well, get in lower. other words, my waist? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I said, in other words, my waist? Yeah, yeah in other words, your weight. <laughs> 